I was reading in uh, the book of John, Gospel John, the other day, and there was a story in there about how Jesus healed a blind man, and uh, this, this blind man was taken by the, um, the leaders, the religious leaders, and, and was questioned. This was before Jesus was was betrayed and crucified and they were finding ways of, of trapping him and um, so they questioned this man and they kept asking him what, what, what happened? Um, tell us the truth. And, and his reply is, is amazing. Um, he basically said, I, I don't know. I don't know what happened. But one thing I do know, I was blind but now I see. And what amazing testimony. And that's a story right there of somebody's life. I don't know everything that happened to me, but there's some things I know, even though I can't explain it all. You know, once I was blind, but now I see. And each of the people that are sharing their stories through these weeks here have a story like that, you know, a story of, of change and their eyes opening and, and being able to see and understand things in new ways and being able to make different decisions with their lives. Um, and it encourages me and inspires me. Um, Jay's one of those guys, so why don't you come on up here, Jay. Um, Jay has, and his wife Leanne have been a part of our uh, journey class this year. Um, and that I was one of the co-leaders for that class that met on Wednesday nights for like eight, nine months every week. And uh, when Jay uh, and his wife Leanne came to the class the first time, I thought they were, they were one of the couples, I, one of the people I didn't know at all. And I thought, who are these guys? Um, and and Jay, Jay kind of started out fairly quiet, you know, he said, um, just kind of sat there and I just kept wondering, who is this guy? And... Uh, but sitting at his table a few times and, and visiting with him, and then when Jay got up in, uh, in the journey class to, to share his narrative, to share his story that he'd been working on for weeks and weeks, um, got to know him pretty quickly then, um, a lot about him, and have grown to really appreciate what God is doing in his life um, and what he's committed to and what he desires for himself and for his family. So this is Jay Kimball. Glad that Jay could be here this morning. Pretty brave thing to stand up here. You maybe have seen him back there, but that's in the back row of the band. This is in the front row of the stage, a whole different place, right? Yep. All right, thanks, Jay. Let's welcome Jay this morning. Oh, thank you, Kat. <clears throat> Excuse me, good start, huh? Thank you, guys. Uh, my story begins the summer of 1979 in the small town of Independence, Louisiana. My parents divorced a couple years after, and that began a young life of always being the new kid. My mom moved me around a lot while young to keep me away from my dad because she blamed him for their breakup. A couple of times I was able to visit for the summer, but that's pretty much it. Both were into drinking and drugs, using and dealing. Don't ever remember being around that, but I'm pretty sure I was. Because while laughing, my dad's told me a story of when I was about 18 months old, I got into his bourbon and coke on the coffee table. I ended up drinking enough to where I couldn't walk around. After their separation and my mom being granted custody of me, she took me to Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas, where some of my first memories were of trying to fit in and establish myself every year in a new school from kindergarten to second grade. In that time, my mom met someone new and remarried. They had my brother when I was 10 and my sister when I was 13. My stepdad, who raised me as his own, was a great dad. Not without his faults, but all in all, he did a great job. And we've had a pretty good relationship all my life. My mom's new relationship didn't make a difference when it came to drugs. I'm not sure if my stepdad was into drugs prior to meeting my mom, but my guess is he was. For the most part, I think it was a lot of marijuana, but I know through talks with them that harder drugs like meth and cocaine were around at times. My stepdad is originally from Janesville, Iowa. It's kind of ironic that's where my, wife's, my wife Leanne's family is from, where we currently live and where we hope to raise our family. But he was offered a job back in Iowa and ready to get back to where his family was. So there I was again, going to the third grade, eight years old, and starting another new school. But at least this time I was able to stay here for more than one year. 
I did okay in school, average grades, only because I didn't like doing homework. I remember one time being 50 plus pages behind in third grade math homework, but still acing tests. I figured since I was smart enough to get it in class and do well on tests, I shouldn't have to do homework. It's, it's a little bit of my rebellious side coming out. See, I've learned the way that my brain works is by doing. I have the hardest time reading something and putting it into practice, but if I'm shown how to do something, usually it takes once. I tell you this because later in my life, it contributes to me going down the wrong path. I also remember having to go to school counseling during elementary. I don't recall what sparked the school to recommend this. My guess, it was the fighting, the goof goofing off in class, and the general defiance in my attitude. I never knew it was counseling, though. I got to go to the counselor's office during class time, play board games or Uno or some, <clears throat> excuse me, or some other thing while they tried to figure out why I did the things I did. But I made it through grade school, and that summer after fifth grade was awesome. My mom and dad made arrangements for me to spend the summer with him. I was ecstatic. And not only was he coming up to get me, but he was coming on a Harley. Yeah, that's right. I got to ride a thousand miles from here to Louisiana on the back of a full-dressed Harley. Some say this was a little irresponsible with my dad, but to me, it was just cool. And the reality was, it was cheaper on gas. So, um, we camped out one night, also to save money, but I didn't know this at the time, and now this is one of my most cherished memories that my dad and I share. That summer was great. I was given a go-kart, got to ride four-wheelers around the trailer court, and had my first crush. It all came crashing down when I returned to Iowa at the end of the summer. My dad brought me back, but when we showed up at my house, I found out that we had moved again. We went from living in Waterloo to a farmhouse north of Tyson, almost to Denver. Talk about a shock. My neighborhood, the comfort I felt, and the times of biking from house to house was all gone. One good thing was that my mom made arrangements for me to continue on Waterloo schools. But when my grades dropped from B's and C's to D's and F's in the first semester of middle school, I was pulled from Waterloo and sent to Denver. This was my first taste of small town living and the cliques that go along with it. Not only was I the new guy, but in their eyes, I was from the big tough town of Waterloo. I had to once again go through the rigmarole of trying to fit in. One good thing about the, the bad boy persona is that small town good girls love it, and I had a girlfriend within a week. <laughs> but even this didn't keep the fights from starting again. If anything, it fueled the fire. This rebellion landed me in counseling sessions through most of my first year in Denver. After that, I think I settled in and was accepted by most kids and those that didn't accept me tolerated me. I went to the dances and football games, but never really felt like I fit in. But honestly, I believe by the time I graduated, I was friends with everyone in my class. During middle school, though, since we had moved out of Waterloo, I regularly went to spend the night with friends back in town, and that's when the drugs started. I don't really remember the first time smoking weed or drinking, but I was 12 or 13. I made the decision early that I wasn't a big drinker. Hangovers and puking were not my idea of a good time, Plus, that out of control, being that out of control wasn't for me. I don't recall how my parents and I got comfortable about me doing drugs, probably because they knew I was smoking, and I knew they were smoking, and they figured they couldn't tell me not to do something that they themselves were doing, so it was just pushed aside. They never smoked in front of me, and I didn't with them either. At this time, I was still only using with Waterloo friends. That would soon wane and disappear as they would become more distant, and I got into high school and found the drug crowd in Denver. Between middle and high school, my parents bought a house back in Waterloo, so we moved again. At some point in here, my stepdad got saved. I've never asked him what brought this on, honestly, until I was asked to share my story had it even crossed my mind. But he was on fire for the Lord. Quit the drugs, though my mom didn't. He started going to church, going to prayer meetings, carrying one of those small New Testaments with him everywhere. Before long, everyone that he worked with called him Rev, short for Reverend because all he would talk about is God and proclaim the good news. This was my first encounter with the Holy Spirit and its power. I had went to church with my grandparents a little if I stayed at their house overnight on Saturday, but nothing like this. I was totally intrigued by this change. See, for as long as I can remember, I felt there was more to this world than what we see. I love magic and illusion, the force from Star Wars, and when I read, it's fantasy novels where my favorite characters are the wizards and mages that draw their power from beyond this world. In my head at the time, these things and what the Bible says God could do were on the same level. There was a power at work here that I was drawn to. 
I would join him in church and a few prayer meetings, but I soon pushed it aside to, so I could live my own life. At 14, I got my learner's permit to drive and was granted a school permit, so I was able to stay in Denver. Life was pretty uneventful to start high school, partying when I could and doing well enough in school to not get in trouble at home. The summer I turned 16, my real dad came back into my life. In the time that elapsed from the last I saw him dropping me off at the farmhouse when I was 11, he had moved to Germany with my stepmom, who had joined the army and got stationed overseas, then returned to Louisiana. Before they left, there was an opportunity for me to go. I was granted a passport and everything was in order, but at the last moment, my mom pulled the plug. I received one letter in the time he was gone. During this time, I was becoming more and more rebellious, had a couple of run-ins with the law, I did my community service and probation. I was pretty angry with my mom for not letting me go to Germany, so I begged her to let me go live with my dad when he returned, and she agreed. But I promised her I would come back to Iowa to graduate. I didn't find out until later that my dad had to pay her half the back child support that was owed or she wouldn't allow it. Because like so many other divorced fathers, he worked a job until child support caught him, then he moved on. So in essence, I was sold by my mom to my dad for $11,500. I got to Louisiana and almost immediately started messing up. Skipped a lot of school because I already knew everything they were teaching. Seriously, they were teaching me stuff as a junior that I learned here in 8th grade. When I did go, I fought. Started doing heavier drugs like LSD and prescription medication. I also delved a little into the Wiccan religion and witchcraft. Like I said before, I love magic. And this was the real thing. I go to New Orleans and visit all the voodoo and witchcraft shops. Bought spell books and ingredients. Did a lot of reading, but never put any of it into practice. It still intrigues me, but I believe the power that people gain from this is in reality coming through demons and Satan's forces that have deceived them into believing they themselves have this power. Somehow, I was able to gain enough credits in the year and a half that I lived with my dad that when I returned from my last semester in Denver, I would be able to graduate. After graduating before the end of the summer, I was in trouble with the law, charged with my first felony for a stupid drunken mistake. Later that year, I answered a phone call that would forever change my life. It was a friend that was deep into meth and offered to give me some. All I had to do was go with him and give him a ride around for the night while he gathered ingredients and cooked what he called a batch. I don't think he intended to teach me how to make meth, but remember, if you show me, it usually takes once. For the next two years, I sank deeper into this world, a vicious cycle of staying up for days until I ran out, crashing, then getting up and heading out to make another batch. I would make some, sell enough to get more ingredients, and do the rest with friends. Of course, I got busted. I had been up for seven straight days and nights and got pulled over for running a red light. Your brain really doesn't work that well after being awake that long. The cops searched me, found drugs, but more importantly, they found the hotel key to the room I was staying in. They went back and searched it. Didn't find any drugs, but found three people that I had been partying with. One was a 17-year-old girl that I had no idea was a minor. This young, girl later became <clears throat> this young girl later became very significant when it came time for the county to decide what charges to file against me. It was at this point God reached out to me. It was like it was buried deep in my being. I don't, re- I don't know how I knew it was him, but I just knew. He put a calmness inside me. I felt a safety in his presence, and I also knew that I had to choose. It would not be forced upon me. What came to mind was the change I'd seen in my stepdad. Could I have that? Could I live that kind of purposeful life? In that 7 by 12 foot cell, one night after lockdown, about two weeks after getting busted, I surrendered to his offer of a better life. Tears ran down my face, and a cleansing warmth ran through my body. I equate the physical feeling to drinking a mug of hot chocolate on a chilly winter's day. The next morning, I was released. Was this a miracle or part of the state law that says if the county doesn't file trial information within 14 days, they have to release the offender? This doesn't happen very often, so you can make your own conclusion. I've made mine. I wish I could say this turned my life around immediately, but shamefully, I didn't. By getting in trouble this time, I had violated the probation I was on from that first felony I got when I was 18. This sent me to a Mason City halfway house, which I completed no problem. Upon release, I thought it was a good idea to have a fresh start in a new city, so I moved to Mason. They called the area the North End. I found out it was drug central. I was soon back to my old ways, except this time I wasn't only doing meth, but crack and cocaine. 
and not only smoking it, but started shooting up too. This was a dark time. Satan really was trying hard, and that's partly how I know I'm meant for something more than I can even imagine. It wasn't long before Blackhawk County caught up with me, and I had to face the music for the drug charges back in Waterloo. I ended up getting charged with a number of things, which totaled up to 199 years if served consecutively, which was possible. The biggest one was a modified distribution to a minor law that now made it a 99-year sentence with a 33 years to be, made, to be mandatory. I was the first one in the state to be charged with this new, new law and was going to be made an example. My family and I fought it for 11 months while I sat in jail, going through four different lawyers. I ended up taking a plea and was sentenced to 50 years with a four-year mandatory. Keep in mind, that doesn't mean they had to let me out after four years. After spending 330 days in jail, not being able to go outside, and seeing roughly the same 50 guys every day, heading out to prison really didn't seem that bad. I got to Oakdale Prison a few weeks prior to the disaster of 9-11. While there, I was selected as a candidate by a director of a faith-based program called IFI, the Interchange Freedom Initiative. It was an intensive 18-month program where I would be given the chance to dig into the Bible and get my required drug treatment done. I believe this was God knocking on my door, but once again, I tried to do things on my own and turn down IFI. I figured my mandatory was up in two years with good time, so the state would get me into treatment and I'd be right, out right after that. I went through classification like everyone else and was shipped out to Fort Dodge Correctional Facility. Once there, I learned from my caseworker that with such a large sentence, treatment was a long way off, no matter what my mandatory was. After about 10 months, I was given the opportunity to transfer to Clorinda Correctional Facility in the southwest corner of Iowa under the guidance of my caseworker that I would get into treatment faster. But upon arrival to Clorinda, I was told my sentence was just too long. So I sat. I had bought a guitar while in Fort Dodge, and this is what I did with most of my time. Time here was the hardest on my family. It was four and a half hours away, so visits, visits didn't happen that often. My brother and sister grew up and made memories that I wouldn't be able to share. Finally, God had mercy on me, and that same program director for IFI decided to meet with me again. This time I accepted. Though I told myself it was just to get my treatment done so I could see the parole board, God had other plans. I transferred to Newton Correctional Facility where the program was and was flooded with God almost immediately. The atmosphere in the cell house was different. Most of the guys in the unit walked with a different air about them. They had something behind their eyes when you talked with them. I would soon find out it was true freedom. Behind 25-foot double fences with razor wire lining the top, these men were free. I dove right in, going to class pretty much from noon until 8 at night, playing worship as much as I could. This is a passion and, I believe, a gift from him. At one point, I was playing on some sort of worship team every day. I developed a personal relationship with God. I didn't just ask him to answer prayers like a genie granting wishes. I learned to pray for others unselfishly. I talked to him as a friend and learned how to listen for his response. I struggle with being that close to him in my daily life today. I want to, but don't strive like I should. I went on to complete the program, and the day finally came to see the parole board. My caseworker said I had a great shot at going home. I'd done everything they asked or required. I hadn't received any major disciplinary reports in the five years that I had been down. He made it sound like it was a sure thing. The time came, and the board decided I needed to do six more months. This has been the only time in my life when my knees literally gave out on me. I sank down into a chair in the caseworker's office, devastated. But what do you do? You carry on. Six months went by, and I was granted release in March of 2006. I had never told anyone this next part, not even my wife, Leanne, until sharing in the journey class. But on the day of my release, I was terrified. I was actually a half hour late, half hour late to meet the correctional officer that was to walk me out. Because for five and a half years, 1120445A, my inmate number, defined who I was. Even though I went through that program and was immersed with the love of God, would I trust, submit, and give my life to Him? Would I be a changed man or slip back into darkness and eventually become that number again? This past March marked eight years since then, and though I've had some struggles, like all of us, I've been blessed beyond measure. 
As a condition of my release, I had to live at the work release facility in Waterloo. I worked my way through the levels as a model resident, which earned me more and more freedom. I got back into the workforce, first as a convenience store clerk, then as a laborer for a construction company. I then went on to the career I'm most proud of so far in my life, even though I've moved on from it. A union iron worker that allowed me to erect structural steel, among other things, for numerous projects across the state. Most importantly, though, I got plugged into church. I started going to Heartland Vineyard as soon as, the, excuse me, as soon as the facility would allow it. I had met some of the volunteers from there that would regu regularly come to the program to teach and play worship on Friday revival nights. Plus, I had been with my stepdad a few times before. I was set up with a mentor through IFI's aftercare program and started going to a weekly meeting at Heartland called Celebrate Recovery. This is a faith-based recovery program not only for addicts, but anyone that has went through something in their lives where they needed a guided walk through the healing process. I met a Christian woman here and we started dating. She had gone through a divorce about a year before we met, which was her reason for being in the class. We hit it off pretty well, dated for a short period, and without talking to God about it, fooling myself into thinking this was his plan because it had happened so fast, I asked for her hand in marriage. In less than a year after meeting, we were married. The newness would soon wear off as we both got to know each other on a level that should be done before getting married, not after. As you might suspect, we ended up divorced about a year into our marriage. As I reflect on this time and how it, I took it into my own hands, which is my tendency, I know it was God's plan that I met her, not just not for me to marry her. See, Leanne, my wife, had been a co-worker of and friend of my ex at the time. We had been out to dinner with her, helped her move. She had even come to our housewarming party. But I was so focused on my ex being the one that I had chosen, not God, mind you, that I had blind blinders on to any other possibility. Leanne and I stayed connected during my divorce and started dating before the actual finalization of it. We have a lengthy dating history of about three years. We weren't going to make the same mistake that I did. We also wanted to make sure this was a blessing from above. We were married in September 2011 in her parents' backyard in Janesville. It hasn't all been peaches and cream and she drives me nuts sometimes, <laughs> and vice versa, but she completes me. She is full of unconditional love, once you gain her trust, you have it forever. She has tremendous patience, which is good for me, and our daughter tests that every day. Leanne logically thinks things through, whereas I come off as a fly-by-the-seat-of-my-pants fly guy, even though I've usually ran through all of the scenarios in my head already. She hasn't really come to trust that I can do that yet, but she's getting there. She, she really is the one I'm supposed to be with, and I see it more and more each day. We've been blessed with a daughter, I say it's a blessing now, but we'll see how I feel when she's 14 or 15. <laughs> Zoe's going to be two at the end of June, and she is pretty much our life right now. With making Orchard our home church about a year and a half ago, taking the journey class together, Leanne being given the opportunity, opportunity to attend the Leadership Summit conferences, and us being invited to the Orchard Leadership Retreat that was held a few months ago, our spiritual walk together has really blossomed as of late. Prior to this, we were both in a severe drought for the living water that had been poured into us earlier in our lives. I had quit attending Heartland because it had become awkward with the chance I might see my ex, and I had stepped down from any leadership roles that I was in because of the divorce. We sporadically attended churches that we thought might become our home, even tried Orchard, but for some reason, nothing fit at the time. But I think after having Zoe, the desire to bring her and hopefully other children up in a home filled with Christ became more and more of a priority. We were invited to Orchard by someone that has now become very near and dear to us and has been such a blessing to us, I don't think we can ever express our gratitude enough to him. But we tried again, and this time I think this time we felt like this was the place to be. Zoe loves going to the nursery, although it took a little while. I've gotten involved in the worship teams and can't get enough of it, and I think Leanne will soon find her niche too. <laughs> yep, there they are. Leanne, it's amazing she puts up with me, and by being a parent, Zoe has shown me just a sliver of how God loves us as his children. I don't know what, my, what effect my story has had, if any, on those that I've had the chance to share it with in the past, 
but I do know that my walk today affects that wonderful woman that blesses me every day and our beautiful little girl that God has given us. So I pray and fight every day to be the man, husband, and father that only God can make me. My encouragement to those out there that are struggling with the thought that God may have given up on you is that there's no chance that has happened. If you're praying for something that hasn't come to pass yet, or even like me, have accepted him and then walked away, he is still there for you. Like Peter denying him three times, I also denied him three times in my life. First, when my stepdad got saved, God whispered to me then. Next, in, that, in my cell that night when I actually accepted him as my Lord, then turned away. And finally, when the director of IFI came to see me the first time. Again, I just walked away. Those three times are the only ones I remember, the big ones. What about the ones I can't recall? The subtle times when he came, but I was too engrossed in my own things to notice. We were given these little rocks to ride on at the end of journey class about a week and a half ago. They said we could ride anything on there we wanted to that we may, have, we, we may have taken from the class. One of the things I wrote was, God pursues, because through writing my story, no wait, this story is God's story that I just have the honor of being a part of, but it's been revealed to me how much God has pursued me and will pursue you. You are his child, as Jesus is, and he will relentlessly pursue you to show you his love, his blessing, and bring you into his kingdom. Um, I, I want to clarify one thing. Um, any of the people that are speaking uh, through the stories of the seats are, are not people that we believe have arrived, have got it all figured out, you know, and, and life is sweet and, and, and um, uh, you're on top of the world. Uh, uh, Definitely not. That's not you. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> so, and that's the thing that we believe, too, is that we are on a journey. Um, sometimes... Uh, we take hold of the journey that we're on and it takes us to dark places like you've experienced. Um, sometime, sometimes we allow somebody else to guide our lives. And maybe it's not always the right person and they might take us to a dark place too. Um, but like you were saying, I really love what you said at the end, Jay. God is pursuing us. God is offering us his power and his grace um, and his love and he would give us direction and, and he would guide us we'll mess up from time to time um, guaranteed <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's a journey it's a, it's a step by step day by day adventure um, so I appreciate your willingness to share with us this morning thanks I want to say prayer for Jay and and for us and for our hearts through what we have heard. Let's pray together. God, thanks for, thanks for Jay's story and um, thanks for pursuing him. Um, thanks for not, uh, not giving up on him and not turning your back on him. Um, but I believe every day in some way um, whispering into his life. And, and, and I believe you do that for us. You know, some of us this morning may be in, in some of those dark spots and uh, may feel that uh, you know the, the bottom of the well is it's, it's too deep we can't climb out of that um, and maybe you can't um, but God can help you um, God can meet you where you're at and help you to take a next step and then another and then another and when we mess up he'll wait patiently for us to get back on the path again and that's really God's story through all of the Bible his mission is to bring people all of us back home so thanks thanks again for for what Jay shared with us thanks for your truth and your grace within it and may each of us in our own way be challenged and touched by it Jesus' name, amen.